I'm here today with Valerie Brown, author of a new book from Broadleaf Books titled Hope Leans Forward, Braving Your Way Toward Simplicity, Awakening, and Peace. Valerie is a Buddhist Quaker Dharma teacher, facilitator, and executive coach. A former lawyer and lobbyist, she's co-director of Georgetown's Institute for Transformational Leadership, as well as founder and chief mindfulness officer of Lead Smart Coaching. She's an ordained Buddhist Dharma teacher in the Plum Village tradition, founded by Thich Nhat Hanh, and is a certified Kundalian yoga teacher. In her leadership development and mindfulness practice, she focuses on diversity, social equity, and inclusion. Valerie is an award-winning author whose books include The Road That Teaches and The Mindful School Leader with Kristen Olson. Valerie leads an annual pilgrimage to El Camino de Santiago, Spain, to celebrate the power of sacred places. She holds a Juris Doctor from Howard University School of Law, Master of Arts from Miami University of Ohio, and a Bachelor of Arts degree from City University of New York. Valerie tends a lively perennial home garden in one of my personal favorite towns, New Hope, Pennsylvania. You can learn more about Valerie at ValerieBrown.us. So, Valerie, thanks so much for joining us. Congratulations on all you've accomplished. Oh, Brian, thank you so much. Well, it's really a pleasure to get to know you and, you know, find out about your work. So I'm glad we were able to connect here. Um, But before we get started, could you, like, just tell people a little bit more about your background? What else would you like people to know about you? Yeah, well, again, thank you for this opportunity to be introduced to your audience. Um, So I would say that... I was a closet meditator. So for those folks who are out there who have a lot of doubt or fidgety or say, oh, I, there's no way I can meditate, I would say, I, can, I hear you. Uh, for many years, uh, as an attorney, as a lobbyist in a very high-powered, high-pressure career, as a lobbyist and a lawyer representing lawyers and college presidents and boards, I hid my meditation practice. I felt that I was not going to be taken seriously. Um, And actually, many times I felt that I just didn't have the time, quite frankly, to spend 15, 20, 30 minutes in sitting meditation. And Uh, And so I began to practice meditation uh, on the go, meaning I began to practice mindfulness, which is being aware in the present moment of my actions, my thoughts, my words, uh, how I was standing, how I was sitting, the conversations that I was having, And little did I know that that practice was the practice of meditation. And so that practice combined with the study of mindfulness and meditation with this extraordinary teacher, Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, and with the Plum Village community, lots of ups and downs, you know, lots of uh, brushing myself off, trying again, struggling with my own mind and with my own very busy monkey mind um, that I learned a lot about myself and a lot about uh, the practice of how to bring this kind of equanimity into my daily life. So I think that that's a really, I really do resonate with people who say I don't have time I can't meditate, it's not for me. I hear that and I'm, I'm with you. And there's a way, there's, there, are, there are options. <laughs> I struggle with that myself. I mean, I, I spent most of my life in a high tech career, which you know, similarly was very fast paced and you know, consuming and uh, my personality doesn't lend itself to like sitting still <laughs> trying to meditate. So I still need to learn that. Uh, <laughs> but, I, you know, obviously it's been incredibly valuable for a lot of folks. So I, I totally respect that. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things I'd like to uh, have you talk about a little bit is something I mentioned during the introduction was that you're a Buddhist Quaker. Can you explain to folks what that means? 
Yeah, so simply that means that um, I have two faith practices. I am an ordained Buddhist Dharma teacher in the lineage of the Plum Village tradition. It's often considered a lineage that is um, deeply engaged, um, meaning that the, the practice is about the engagement of life in the present moment, an action, an action that is based on skillful means with an ethical component for the benefit of ourselves and others. Um, this is the life work and the life teaching of Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh. And I began studying uh, Buddhism and particularly uh, the Plum Village in the Plum Village tradition in 1995. And in 2018, I was ordained as a Buddhist Dharma teacher. I'm also a member of the Religious Society of Friends, Quakers. And I became a member of the Society of Friends about uh, 20 years ago. Um, I find that both of these religions, these faith traditions, share so much in common. Um, the ground of simplicity and peace is very, is very much in common. The practice of of sitting in silence and meeting for worship and the practice of, of um, a meditation are very, very, very similar. Um, the belief that there is that of God in every person and in the Quaker tradition and in the, the Buddhist tradition, seeing um, that each person carries with them a Buddha nature, um, a, a sense of their own inner um, wisdom, their own inner goodness, um, their own inner Buddha. Um, so there are many, many similarities. I have to say I was raised Roman Catholic and, uh, and went to Catholic school for 12 years. So that is foundational for me. You know, as a child, I was very much uh, drawn to silence and um, prayer. It was just a part of, it was a part of my life. Uh, my mother and grandmother were, were Catholic. Um, and so this was, um, this was also foundational. And uh, I, early on, I began exploring um, other religions outside of Catholicism. So I started uh, studying the ethical humanist uh, framework. Um, I uh, began exploring kundalini yoga and Sikhism. Um, and even to this day, I have a daily practice of kundalini yoga. This I began this morning with an hour of uh, pranayama or um, breath work. And so this is an, uh, a deeply ingrained part of how I live my daily life. And coming to Buddhism and Quakerism was or an organic process. Wow, that's really cool. Um, I, I talk with a lot of folks, you know, about their faith journeys, and I think this is the first that I've, you know, encountered someone that's got uh, your your type. I mean, everybody's different, obviously, but yours is very very unique. <laughs> it's great. Um, so uh, one other thing I understand, you completed uh, facilitation training at the Center for Courage and Renewal, which is co-founded by our friend Parker Palmer. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I think of some of the life events that have been transformative for me, um, certainly my training at the Center for Courage and Renewal would be among the most foundational and I use the practices that I learned in that training every day. So let me just back up and say that even before I trained as a facilitator, I believe it was in 2008, if I'm not mistaken, it's a two year training, maybe it was 2009, but somewhere in there, I had already been a member of the Religious Society of Friends. 
And not only was I a member of the Religious Society of Friends, was I a Quaker, but I was writing for Quaker journals, and I was actually teaching at one of the most important Quaker institutions in the United States, a place called Pendle Hill. Now, this place is a Quaker retreat and study center, but what makes it so foundational for the Center for Courage and Renewal, it is this is the place where Parker Palmer was the executive director for something like 11 to 12 years. Pendle Hill had a tremendous influence on Parker's life, his writing, his thinking. Um, and he, he speaks about this all the time. So I had been a teacher at this place, at Pendle Hill, um, at that point for a number of years. And so I had experienced uh, Quaker faith and practice. I had experienced the community I knew what Parker was talking about firsthand because I was living it. And when I had an opportunity to do the training with Parker and the other co-founders of the center, Rick and Mar Marcy Jackson, um, I didn't hesitate uh, because it, it so resonated with me. Um, one of the great gifts of my life has been with studying and practicing with these enormous giants in their field, people like Parker Palmer and like uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, and to have had many years with uh, both of them, I consider a great gift. And I actually, more than a gift, I feel it's a duty to pass on the wisdom, the teachings, the, the, the knowledge that I have gained from these, you know, these, these people and many others and express it in my own way. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's very powerful. Thank you for sharing all that. So let's talk about books. Um, but before we get into the new one, you have some previous books um, that you already published. Would you like to touch on those a little bit? Sure. Share with folks um, what they're about? Yeah, so even before I published my first book, I started writing, writing articles, particularly for Quaker publications, for um, Pendle Hill, which has a publishing arm. I wrote uh, pamphlets, which is um, extended essays on Quakerism and Buddhism to help people understand the connection between these two great um, world faith traditions. And so I'd, I'd write about silence and write about reflection and discernment. Um, and, and so it came very natural for me to write my first book, which was published by, um, by the Religious Society of Friends. And that was on pilgrimage, The Road That Teaches, um, and is the name of the book. And both uh, Thich Nhat Hanh and Parker um, endorsed the book, and that was incredibly meaningful for me. What I would say is that book was about what I had been experiencing. I was taking off on these pilgrimages throughout the world to try to help me figure out my life. And uh, I realized at some point in time along the way, well, maybe not everybody goes to Dharamsala. Maybe not everyone goes to Machu Picchu. Maybe not everyone takes a pilgrimage in Japan. And that maybe I can offer some insight to, to readers. And so that was, um, that was my first book. My second book was based largely on the work that I had been doing uh, as a meditation teacher uh, and studying and practicing mindfulness and specifically from my work with Parker and my study with Thich Nhat Hanh the book that came out of that was The Mindful School Leader. So I was working as an executive coach and uh, working with many school leaders all over the country. And I'd hear the same thing over and over again. Oh, we want mindfulness for our students. Oh, we want mindfulness for our teachers. 
And then I'd say, well, what about you, school leader? Or what about you, head of school? Or what about you, board member? And they say, well, oh, um, I'm too busy. And, and so I just realized this is a huge gap. We need mindful school leaders as much as we need mindful students. And uh, because this is all interconnected, one is going to affect the other. Um, and so that second book was, um, grew out of that experience. And then finally, um, the book that I've written on hope, Hope Leans Forward, that was actually a book that I would have preferred not to write. <laughs> you know, um, it, it, it grew out of the Black Lives mm -hmm. um, the, the Black Lives Matter movement. It grew out of my own personal crisis. So many, many, many things. Wow. So tell us more about that book. Um, you know, kind of who would you say it's most intended for? It's for, I would say, for anyone who is who has experienced grief or loss or is in transition in their life whether it's a job transition or a relationship transition. So in the book, I talk about the losses and the kind of cascade actually of losses and griefs that I experienced and, um, and, and the transitions. My transition from being a type A lawyer, lobbyist, to being a Dharma teacher um, and how I made that transition and what had to change within me in order for that to happen. Mm -hmm. So in the book's description, it says it's an answer to the question, where is hope now? And so how would you answer that question? Well, you know, sometimes, especially in the midst of a global pandemic with gun violence, um, the opioid epidemic and so many crises, like climate crisis, multiple catastrophes. Hope doesn't seem like, you know, at your fingertips, right? You know, I mean, it's like the first thing that comes to mind isn't hope and joy, or maybe it is, but it can feel very distant. But it's exactly at these times um, that I think that we have to cultivate, and I mean cultivate, like you would cultivate a garden, um, a sense of hope. And hope not as in wishful thinking hope, but hope that is grounded in our values, in service to others, in what is most meaningful uh, in our lives, and then taking skillful action. So we often think that hope is this thing out there, you know, like um, uh, kind of what um, Emily Dickinson wrote about, hope is a thing with feathers. Like it's this ephemeral thing out there. Um, I just wish on it. And what I'm suggesting is that hope is based on values, on wisdom, on action and on skillful means. Mm. Very cool. So um, if I could, I'd like to read a couple of endorsements for the book. This one's from Paul Ingram, who says, each chapter is an exploration of one of seven factors of awakening of Buddhist teaching and practice, mindfulness, investigation, energy, joy, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity in dialogue with Quaker tradition. In particular, Valerie writes as a Buddhist Quaker grounded in her practice of Kundalina Yoga. The end result is an excellent example of how the practice of interreligious dialogue, more often than not, expands one's faith journey in unexpected and creative ways. So you can talk, can you talk about the last part, how you feel that interreligious dialogue um, expands our faith journey? Yeah, so... Um, there have been many, many studies, particularly like if you look at the, the research from the Pew Foundation, um, we, we know that many people identify as spiritual and not necessarily religious. 
And actually, we've seen for many decades, I believe it's Wayne, Wayne Dwyer, certainly Mirror by Star. There are many people who, um, who identify as interreligious. They see the connections um, between various faith traditions. Now, I don't mean this in a, I'm going to uh, dip my toe in the water and take from column A, column B, and column C, as in um, a transactional approach, but immersing oneself deeply into a faith tradition and immersing oneself deeply into another faith tradition. So one of the things that Thich Nhat Hanh has written about and spoken about, uh, we often call Thich Nhat Hanh Thai. Um, Thai is Vietnamese for teacher. But one of the things that Thai has said, and he's again, he's written about this in his book on living Buddha, living Christ. So he's talked about, he's written about this interreligious um, dialogue. And this has been written by many, many other people. Thomas Merton and many others have talked about this. And, and Thai has said that we don't lose our root, but you know, we add to we add to it. And so to Buddhism and and actually to the root of Catholicism, I've added the teachings of the Buddha on the Four Noble Truths or on the on what is it what does equanimity mean? Um, and and to that I've I have added the the teachings from uh, Buddha, from Quaker faith and practice on what does simplicity mean what does equity mean and um, you know what I can see now having you know studied and practiced these various faith traditions for a number of years is how interconnected they are. So um, here's another endorsement. This one's from Reverend Seifu Anil Singh Malaras, Executive Director of Spiritual Directors International, who says, this wonderful book invites you in with its mix of warmth and empathy, skillfully blended with a sense of adventure, discovery, and fun. It is rich, yet meant to be carried lightly, practical, but in the service of the journey toward unknowing. Can you talk a little bit more about the journey toward unknowing? <laughs> oh, that's a delight. Um, you know, we live in an answer-rich culture. And as a lawyer, uh, I got paid good money to give answers. And not just answers, but the right answer. In fact, the brilliant answer. My whole life was spent in being right, being having the right answer. Um, and there's benefit to that. I, and yet, um, there is so much that um, is beyond an answer. Um, and that is um, in the realm of trusting our own intuition, um, in being allowing ourselves to be surprised, synchronicity, play, discovery, awe, wonder, amusement, and I could keep going. Um, these are beyond um, sort of the four corners of no, of uh, the answer. The answer is a box, actually. And so when we are in a spaciousness of not knowing, that's a space of great curiosity where anything is possible. And so that's a space that's wide open. Um, and it's not to say that the answer is right or it's wrong, but it can feel very constricted, very binary. 
And so my practice, and one of the things that Tai has often said to us is to ask ourselves a very important question every day. And that is, are you sure? Are you sure? And it, it's not uh, to throw confusion and doubt, but it's actually um, to create space in our way of thinking and a dash of humility. So many of the things that you're talking about are also things that um, Frederick Buechner wrote about. Um, I worked for Frederick Buechner before I started some of my own businesses. And uh, one of them, quotes that I will try to remember or it was uh, basically anything that's really important you can't prove <laughs> you know he was, he was some I think one of the students had asked us like can you prove you know about this Christianity stuff that, you know I think that was his his answer is anything that really matters can't be proven <laughs> um, but anyway so um, what would you say are your biggest hopes for this new book I would really love to get this out to as many people as possible, particularly at this crucial time of the pre-order of the book. Um, the book is going to be published on November 8th and be available on November 8th. And right now we're in a crucial time where uh, people can pre-order the book. When the book is pre-ordered now, um, you can submit on my website, ValerieBrown.us, a receipt, and you'll get a free e-journal and a 20-minute guided meditation that comes with every pre-order purchase. But what I would say here is that in the, in the book industry, as you know, there are very few voices like mine. Mm -hmm. And if we are going to create the society um, that is diverse and equitable and where all voices are welcome, we need to support people who are speaking in this way. And so pre-ordering the book now sends to publishers, sends a message to publishers, print this book and print <laughs> more of the books, which then creates an opening for other voices like mine. Yes. So I think that's very, very critical. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, usually when I do these interviews, they're much closer to the actual release date of the book. And in this case, it's well in advance. So I'm glad that we're doing it you know, this way because of that very reason. Absolutely. <laughs> so so um, that is my hope is that in pre-order we'll get the word out and that um, there's still several months before the book is published and just get as many pre-orders as we can. Yes, yes. So um, I know you're in the midst of, you know, the launch for this and it's a very important activity, but is there anything you can talk about yet in terms of any future projects? Uh, whether it's book related or other kinds of projects? Yeah, so I have lots of speaking engagements coming up, as you might suspect. Um, this month, I'm going to be at the San Francisco Zen Center hmm. um, uh, virtually talking, uh, that's September 24th, uh, talking about uh, the book. And all of my events are posted on my website, ValerieBrown.us. Um, and so you can you can find me there or on social media. Again, all of my social media links are on my website. Um, so please do follow me there. But I already have um, a, another book that I am I'm I'm thinking about, and um, and again that grew out of so much of the discussion that I've been hearing um, about how to address injustice in the world, whether it's climate injustice or racial or social equity injustice, whatever the injustice we see, food injustices, um, whatever that may be, but how to do that without hating the other side, hmm. without uh, othering the other side. 
And again, this has been the great gift of the teaching from Thich Nhat Hanh and from um, Parker about how to do this. Mm. I speak about this somewhat in the book, but I'm, I, I'm planning to write an entire book on how that can be done. Excellent. That sounds really an important book. So we'll look forward to that. So uh, again, the, the title of uh, Valerie's upcoming book releases in November is called Hope Leans Forward, Braving Your Way Towards Simplicity, Awakening, and Peace. And as Valerie mentioned, you can learn all about her work at ValerieBrown.us. So Valerie, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks for all the work that you've done. You really shed a light, you know, I think, um, for many of us to follow. So I really appreciate learning about it, all of that. Brian, thank you so much. It's been a delight.